The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise this book of Acts that we have been reading through uh, this Easter season is uh, fun to read these stories because we only read them during, the, during this season of Easter and on the day of Pentecost. I think I, I, think I said that last week. Um, now that I, now that I say it, but uh, uh, the great stories, amazing stories, and the the story that preceded today's reading was that uh, Peter has this vision about unclean animals being let down in a sheet from heaven. He hears a voice, Peter, kill and eat, and he says, "No, Lord, you know I've never eaten anything unclean." It's a good Jewish man. And the voice says, you shall not call unclean what the Lord has cleansed. And the vision is repeated three times, taken back up to heaven. And Peter ponders this, and there's a knock at the door. Some servants from a Roman centurion, a commander of 100 soldiers, knocking at the door, says, our, our master would like you to come and uh, speak to us. And so Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, the Gentile, the Roman soldier, who is a good, God-fearing man, and lays out the story about Jesus, and uh, the Holy Spirit falls upon them as, they are, as Peter is explaining the story of Jesus, can't even get through the story. They, they begin uh, praising and worshiping God, and, um, and Peter says, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then Peter has these Gentiles baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It is difficult for us in our time and place to imagine the scandal of this story as it would go out and be repeated throughout the, throughout, throughout the churches of that region. He baptized Gentiles. How, how could he? How dare he do something like that? What is the matter with that Peter? Uh, it, it, it was very difficult for them to understand this. For generations, Peter's people, the Jewish people, had thought that God loved them because of some special merit. Uh, maybe their Jewish ancestry, first of all, tracing way back to Abraham, and then there was Moses and Elijah and the prophets, or maybe it was their unique faith in one and only one God, thought God loved them specially for that. Uh, it had not yet dawned on them that God loved them because God is love. And God loved them for that reason and no other reason. That is the essential message we believe that Jesus taught and the message that he died for. God just loves people like a good mother loves her child only more as we see in the crucifixion and then in the resurrection. As we plumb the depths of those incredible uh, moments in one divine motion into our life and up out of death, we understand that God's love is like a mother's love only more. If our loveliness to God, if, if our belovedness in the sight of God is built on the foundation 
of some people worse than us being loved less, then we will always be astounded, you see, when they receive the Holy Spirit, when we thought they should have been excluded. It doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't really make sense to our human way of thinking. How can everyone be loved equally? But mothers easily grasp what Christ taught and revealed. God loves even the erring child, maybe especially the erring child, the mother's heart of love goes out to that one. It's what confounded Tommy Smothers. You remember Tommy Smothers? Mom always loved you best, he says to his brother. No, Tommy, you're wrong. Mom loved you best, too. God loves us all best. We see it in our mothers. On this Mother's Day, I think it's good to reflect on our actual experiences of being mothered. Because that's where God's love starts, in a mother's heart, as she brings us to birth and then begins to bring us up into life. Uh, she loves us, whether we're naughty or nice, whether we're successful or whether we're living on skid row. Her heart goes out to us. People may or may not grasp that this gift of mother's love actually comes from the heart of God, but it does. Some people almost think, though, that mothers love us more than God, more consistently, more faithfully than God, gives up less easily than God, but how could that be? How could a mother's love, is, as imperfect as our mothers are, be greater than the love of God? A lake cannot rise higher than the spring that feeds it. George MacDonald was fond of saying that God's best gifts are those gifts which he gives to his children most abundantly and freely, like the blue of the sky or the green of the fields, or the spirit to them who seek it. Perhaps he might have added, like a mother's love, which carries a weighty, load of God's love to us. So when Jesus says, abide in my love, I thought, as I was thinking about this sermon, I thought, what can we learn from our mothers? What would they say? Uh, see if uh, your mother's taught you some of the same lessons my mom taught me, or tried to teach me, I suppose. I remember one of the th things I remember my mom saying more than once, early on, Two wrongs don't make a right. Any of your mothers say that? Kind of gather that common wisdom and give it to your children. They need it. They need to hear that stuff. Two wrongs don't make a right, she said. Usually, I, I, I suppose, um, it was when I was fighting with one of my two sisters. She hit me first. Two wrongs don't make a right, young man. So if we're to love God with all our heart, if we are to abide in the love of God with all our mind and heart and strength and soul, we cannot love only those who love us because two wrongs don't make a right. God doesn't love only those who love him, and neither should we, which means that this love of God business is tough, mean, hard business sometimes. Nothing flowery, nothing emotional, uh, Nothing sentimental about this love of God. It's got a hard edge. It might not make sense all the time to us, but it is right. To love is the right way to live. Something else my mother said, don't hit your sisters, she said. I, I, I thought it would be okay if I didn't use a closed fist. But she didn't want me to hit them at all, even when they deserved it, which they often did. <laughs> and I have a sister here today. You can ask her. <laughs> she will confess it, I'm sure. Uh, it was sort of an early lesson in nonviolence, I suppose. In Jesus, God shows us that he is nonviolent. In Jesus, God says, I will not hit you. Peace 
be with you. He says, I want you, my children, to be a brother, to be sister, a good brother or sister to everyone, even to people of other religions. You don't have to agree with others. You don't have to practice what others practice, but don't hit. No hitting in the house of God. Thirdly, we were not to say shut up in our family. Some of you had that rule in your houses. Don't, we don't say shut up in this house, right? Um, my mother could have quoted Colossians 4, 6 to me. Let your speech be full of grace, always seasoned with salt, and so on. But uh, she didn't. She just said, we do not use those words in this house. It's a good way to stay centered in the love of God. Be polite. Be civil. It makes a difference. Number four, she said, Dean, don't be a know-it-all. She said, um, don't think that you are better than others. Peter was amazed when he learned this lesson there in the house of Cornelius. God poured out his Holy Spirit even on the Gentiles. He learned that lesson that day, but I am amazed that Peter had not learned it earlier in life. It makes me wonder a little bit about Peter's mother. Fifth, I think our mothers tell us, believe in yourself, son, daughter. Believe in yourself. Like Peter up here, forgot to believe in himself, that he could obey the command of Christ and walk on the water. He noticed the waves. He began to sink. He began to cry out, Lord, save me. Peter, why did you doubt? He wasn't doubting Jesus. He was looking at Jesus, saying, Lord, save me. He had plenty of faith in Jesus. Where his faith failed was the faith that he himself could walk where Jesus bid him walk. Have faith in yourself, our mothers tell us. It's good advice because when we stop believing in ourselves, we get discouraged, and when we get discouraged, we forget the previous four points. And if I believe in myself, with all my hang-ups, and with all my problems and issues and shortcomings, then it's almost a natural thing for me to be able to believe in others in spite of their shortcomings. Verse 3 in a wonderful hymn in our book says, Mothering God, nurturing one, in arms of patience, hold me close, so that in faith I root and grow until I flower, until I know, until I know the love of God. God believes in you even when you don't believe in yourself, so believe in God. That is, believe that God believes in you. And then pray for those who may be having a hard time believing in themselves. Martin Luther urged his students to think of themselves as being little Christs in the world. Um, but he might just as well have said, be little mothers. Mother one another. We could all do a lot worse. Now I want to close with a poem by a guy named Marshall Davis Jones. Uh, Jones grew up in a poor black uh, ghetto neighborhood in one of our nation's big cities where faith and hope were hard to come by. But it was a place where fathers, by the way, were often drug addicts or worse. And uh, as I say, faith and hope were hard to come by, but the white hot light of a mother's love shone like an arc welder in that dark place, like a constant miracle. Here's his poem. Last night I had the most interesting dream. In it I was six years old in a national spelling bee. Complex words, duodenum, serendipity, flachinau sinahilapilification. Up until the final round, one word between me and victory. The spellmaster clears his throat. <clears throat> Young man, your word is father. The crowd began to chatter among themselves, seemingly displeased at the simplicity of this final word. 
I search for those eyes, those eyes that say, everything's going to be okay, just do it. I dazed off. Young man, your word is father. I stood up straight, licked my lips and began, father, M-O-T-H-E-R, Father. The spellmaster looks at me, down at his flashcard, back up at me. Sorry, but you are incorrect. I don't understand. My father's sitting right in the audience. Excuse me? I am sorry, son, but you are incorrect. Well, then. You can save your sorry apologies because you must mean in correct, as in within the parameters of being right. Let me explain something to you, because obviously you ain't grow up where papas are rolling stones down the hills of women's backsides, and when he's gone, all he's left us was alone. Where minstrel men stroll around on bikes while fathers balanced their menstrual two jobs, two kids, and a life on a unicycle, and it looks something like this. Breastfeeding on one arm, phone on the shoulder, cooking with the other arm, cleaning with one leg, tying sneakers with their teeth, young fathers who make mistakes because we are not all perfect. But the one mistake they never make is abandoning their seeds you see, fathers are master gardeners. They tend to every leaf, removing the weeds, placing us in the windows of opportunity so that we can lean towards the sun. And never forget that the sky is the limit. Planting kisses on our cheeks, hugs on our backs, growing their love on us the best way they know how. Like my father, my father sacrificed owning nothing that I may have everything. My father walked a daily nightmare so that I may live out my dreams. My father watered me with blood, sweat, and tears so that I may be ripe for the harvest. And I hope that one day I can grow up to be as great a father as she was for me. You ask me to spell father, and father is, always has been, and always will be spelled M-O-T-H-E-R. So get your encyclopedias, show me your flashcards, open your dictionary, because what Webster says means nothing around here. Around here, my father is sitting right there, and I love her. See, when it came to mothers, God and this poet thought outside the box. And when it came to you, your mother thought outside the box. And when it comes to God, we all need to remember to begin to think outside the box. And then, outside the box, Maybe only then, when it comes to one another, we'll be able to think outside the box and abide in the love of Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen.